This meeting is being recorded. Welcome back to class. So again, as a schedule reminder, we will have a recitation on Monday. <clears throat> and for uh, CAD beginners, it'll uh, spend unpack parametric hierarchical algorithmic grow into that and then do some exploration of uh, AI in CAD. So all about design on uh, Monday recitation. And then this week, we're finally in the lab. So this week is going to be on cutting tools. Then uh, next week, we'll start electronics and programming. So for this week, it'll be vinyl cutter and laser cutter. And you may already be familiar with them, but we'll go from beginner to more advanced things you can do with them. As a reminder, each week I link an example assignment. And so this is a good, a really good example for this week. Uh, Sean made a cardboard marble construction kit. So you can uh, roll the marbles down, but then you can do more interesting things. And so in particular, I really like this example. Uh, this is a, a binary counter. So as it toggles, he's counting uh, marbles in binary code. So the assignment as a group is going to be to characterize your laser cutter. Individually, it's to cut anything on the vinyl cutter. And then on the laser cutter, you're going to make a construction kit. It has to be parametric to account for the materials, which I'll talk about. You have to account for kerf and then design a kit that can be assembled multiple ways and for extra credit, ha have curving rather than flat elements. And so that goes from beginner laser cutting to more advanced use of a laser cutter. So for tools, uh, there are knife cutters. So uh, Cricut makes a few hundred dollar uh, um, cutters with a knife. These are commonly called vinyl cutters, even though they do much more than vinyl. Uh, Roland makes ones that are uh, a bit more expensive, but heavier duty. And then in my lab, I have one of these that cost about $200,000. It's a giant one. Um, this hasn't been developed since, but we'd like to see it. Um, oh, we need not have to get through an ad. Um, this was done by former students. Uh, this is a, a, a power driven knife uh, plotting in cardboard. Uh, so that's the other cutter. And then one more kind of knife is these are really crazy if you've never used one. Uh, these ultrasonic knives, um, let's see, have they? Um, I'll, let me get a better link. Um, so the the little cutters mainly cut paper or um, cardboard materials like that. But here, let's. Oh, oh, they make the internals. I'll find a better link. Uh, so yeah, th th this is an example. Uh, when you turn this on, it it's not clear anything is happening. It just looks like a knife you could use by hand, uh, but it's pumping ultrasonic energy into the tip. And so if you put it into the wood, the wood immediately starts smoking and you slice through it. And what's amazing is if you put it in plastic, um, it, it immediately melts the plastic and it slices through like butter. Um, by putting ultrasonic energy into the knife. 
And so um, there's a number of uh, things you can cut with the ultrasonic knife that you can't cut with a non-driven knife. Michael is pointing out the wonder cutter. Uh, okay, so that's another version of these um, uh, ultrasonic tools. So uh, those are knife tools, and I'm going to talk more about the vinyl cutters. Uh, one step up from that is uh, there are printing and cutting tools. So Roland, for example, makes these tools that have the knife integrated with the printing. So the other tools you can print and then bring it over and cut it. This in one operation uh, lets you print and cut. Uh, then we're going to cover lasers. So Epilogue, Universal, Trotec, GCC, we use all of those. These are bulk in the range of maybe $10,000 for a, a, a common one. They, they go up above that, but, but that's the scale. These are uh, really robust, really reliable, run for years. Then there are uh, these lower cost lasers, so full spectrum uh, laser sore. These are bringing laser cutting down to a few thousand dollars. Uh, not as much power, they're not as robust for long-term use, but making laser cutting more accessible. And I'd say these are the most used tools in a fab lab. They're perhaps overused. They're maybe the most overused tools, but certainly the most use, used tools because it's really instant gratification. Almost anything you do on them takes uh, minutes rather than hours. Then beyond that, just as a few examples, uh, this was a company spun out of my lab that has a much more powerful, of explained sources. This is what's called a fiber laser. And this is powerful enough to cut uh, substantial metal. And this is about sixty or seventy thousand um, dollars. This um, uh, it, um, I have one of these in the lab to do micro machining. This is now in the ballpark of a hundred thousand dollars, but it lets you make uh, micron scale features, like for MEMS devices, and um, Let's see, that link is, uh, fix link. I'll fix that link. This is a kind of laser that's a few hundred thousand dollars and it makes pulses of light that are so short, they're, they're femtoseconds, just a few cycles of light. And in that short time, they're so powerful, they rip the material apart on an atomic scale. So we're going to focus on the knife cutters and laser cutters. But other tools to know about are, um, oh, right, um, good. Uh, Adrian is reminding me of an important tool to add to this intro, which is uh, Danielle, uh, Fab Academy guru, has created this open design of a laser cutter for Fab Labs that, that's priced more like the more affordable lasers um, but with the specs of the more expensive one in an open design. Absolutely, I'll add that link. Um, other tools to know about is uh, plasma cutters uh, create a, a plasma of tens of thousands of degrees that cuts through metal. Um, those used to be very messy for the surface finish. They've gotten much better. They're fairly dangerous. You need it to use it in the equivalent of like a welding shop because jets of um, molten sparks come shooting out from it, but those let you plot in metal. Then water jet cutters use a supersonic jet of water with a garnet abrasive and they cut through anything, any material, literally whatsoever, glass, steel, ceramic, absolutely anything. These ones cost about $100,000. Wazers are little tabletop ones. These are ballpark uh, $10,000, much more affordable. The limitation is these are lower pressure, so these end up using more of the garnet. You have to keep feeding it uh, garnet to do the cutting. But they let you. But they're good starting water jets for labs that let you cut in harder material. Um, 
Let's see, Walter is linking a hybrid machine. Interesting, uh, combining those. Um, don't know anything about that one. Then uh, hot wire cutters, uh, th this has a hot, literally a hot wire that moves in 3D. Um, I'll fix that link. And the killer app for these is architectural trim. So what you can do is take a foam and it melts through the foam and it makes things like uh, molding um, and it's just cutting foam, but then you can seal it or you can cast it. And then the last cutting tool is uh, these um, have a metal wire and you make a plasma around the wire and it cuts through metal, but at very, very high resolution with very, very good surface finish. And those are maybe $100,000 machines. This was a, a first version of uh, 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 these are called EDMs, electrical discharge machining. Uh, uh, this is an EDM made with an EDM. So the sort of parts you see are made with a bigger EDM, and then this is making a smaller EDM. Uh, Walter, you mentioned you got the X tool. Do you like it? Yeah, it's a uh, it's amazing. Um, you can choose it between the five watt and a ten watt, and it has a camera inside, and the and the software lets you. It load the, the DXF files on top of them. So it's really easy to center objects when you try to laser cut or vinyl cutting. Nice, interesting. Didn't I didn't know about that one. Okay, so that's the space of tools for this week. Um, you're gonna be doing CAD. So again, you're gonna be, uh, this could be a sticker on your laptop. This is the construction kit. So. These are 2D design, but you may or may not design it in 2D versus 3D. So you can certainly do it in Inkscape. Um, Inkscape has a number of extensions uh, aimed at, uh, in particular, there are a number for making laser cut patterns in Inkscape. And, um, oh yeah, this is the video I already showed you, but. But in this video, I'm using Inkscape with clones to make uh, cutouts. So you could do it. Um, this is a link to uh, using Rhino and Grasshopper. Uh, Blender has geometry nodes I mentioned. Um, and Blender also, I'll add a link. Um, uh, has a... Um, uh, an emerging constraint solver. Then for um, FreeCAD, I'll just quickly recap. I did this last week, but let's see it again this week, where in the sketcher, um, I cut out the slots and then I add constraints and I dimension the slots. So now I can make a single parameter and it'll propagate through, through the design. <clears throat> and that's essential for this week because the key parameter uh, for this week is the thickness of the stock. And you need to be within a few thousandths of an inch. So you wanna make that a parameter uh, that propagates through. Um, let's see. Sir Bun is mentioning there's, um, let's see. Sorry, the, the link I'm getting there. Let me, let's see, is it, a, maybe it's a cutting and pasting issue. Okay. Uh, oh, that's interesting. FreeCAD is adding a node editor. Interesting. Uh, and then let's come back to here. Uh, yeah, um, Tom, I do mention Cuddle in a moment. Uh, so uh, FreeCAD is a good choice. Uh, Fusion and SolidWorks all let you do the parametric design. 
Uh, Fusion used to have a really nice tool written by my students um, uh, that's been deprecated by Autodesk, and I don't know if anything replaces it. Um, it was a, a nice tool to let you do this sort of slicing, and I'm, I, I'm not sure uh, what happened to it with them. Uh, on shape has Kirimoto as an app uh, um, for cutting. Uh, oops, I closed the wrong tab. Yeah, uh, Rico, you were mentioning the uh, CAD sketcher is, is the Blender extension. Then there's a number of dedicated tools. So these are a few different versions of, um, this is a design tool specifically for cutting. Um, this is a, colleague in Germany who's made this environment uh, designed for designing things like you see. Um, this is a tool for cutting and folding. Um, these are uh, tools specifically dedicated uh, to cutting processes. So you'll need to pick one of those. Then we begin CAM that's going to be a recurring subject. So CAM is taking your design. So once we've designed the alien, this is sending it to the vinyl cutter. This is sending it to the laser cutter. You have to turn your design into something the machine understands. The most common way to do it is with uh, printer drivers. So each of these machines typically can appear as a printer and then you print to it. I'm not a fan of that because every machine has a different version of its print driver. Typically, you have to click through lots of screens to get into the settings. And typically, they make assumptions about how you're using it. So for example, they don't anticipate making flexible electronic circuits on a vinyl cutter. So the alternative is to talk more directly to the machine. So for Inkscape, Ink Cut is an Inkscape extension to talk to 2D cutting tools. And then nesting is going to be an important topic for this week. Uh, nesting is you'll have stock, say a piece of cardboard. You're going to cut out pieces of the project, and you need to figure out how the pieces fit in the bed. And so this is a tool uh, that uh, helps you with the job of nesting to figure out where your stock fits in the bed. And then. Uh, years ago, I wrote uh, Mods. Uh, Mods has grown into a community-supported project led by Fran. And so here's an example in that where uh, I'm in Mods. I'm going to pick the machine. So I'm going to pick a vinyl cutter. Um, then in here, I can bring in a bitmap or a vector tool, of um, an SVG. Then what it's going to do, what it just did is an important operation that's in a number of other tools, but it's easy to do here, which is tracing. It took your design, it found the boundary, it did the offsetting, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then it formatted it to send to the tool. And so you can do the whole workflow in the browser. And what's nice is each of these modules you can open to see how it works. And you can combine the modules. If you want to talk to a different tool, you can, for example, change the configuration of how you talk to the tool. So um, some machines this doesn't work for because they have proprietary hardware interfaces. Uh, but for the machines with open interfaces, which includes a number of the vinyl cutters, you can use mods as an open transparent way to do it rather than printer drivers. I just updated all the programs to use web serial and web USB. Ah, OK. So uh, this is Fran. And uh, what he's mentioning is the Google Chrome derived browsers that includes Chromium, and I believe it should work in Edge, can talk directly to serial ports for the devices. Um, otherwise, you need a little driver to talk to it. Good, Fran. And yeah, any questions, Fran's following along and can help with mods. So now we're going to drill in or cut in on the vinyl cutter and the laser cutter. So first, the vinyl cutter 
this is a link to Victoria. Some students fall in love with the vinyl cutter. So for example, uh, she did all of her electronics assignments on the vinyl cutter. Um, so we're going to cover milling PCBs, but on the left is a circuit board she made uh, just with the vinyl cutter. Uh, the vinyl cutter, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about both why it's popular, but why it's not popular in a little bit. So here's another good example of what you can do. This is a self-flapping crane. So it, it, it bends its wings. And to do that, the vinyl cutter scored the pattern, it cut out the circuit, and then assembled uh, it. So with the vinyl cutter, the obvious thing you can do is you can make signs. So like lettering on buildings with room numbers is a classic thing. Uh, you can do thermal transfers. So here, um, I cut in a vinyl material, and then I used a heat press, or you can use an iron, and you can melt it into fabric. So you can make uh, logos and shirts, for example, uh, with thermal transfers. Um, you can make uh, books that pop up, greeting cards that uh, pop up. Uh, this was written by a former student, Amanda. And she, uh, this is, it. origami is, is folding, uh, kirigami adds cuts to it. Um, and so she has all sorts of beautiful examples of, um, so here, here's a pop-up castle. Um, and these are built-in ones, but you can add your own. And so uh, this beautiful tool lets you go between flat and folded. And amazingly, she can also, she's also calculating the forces in the structure. Um, so origami, kirigami. Um, you can uh, make screen printing masks uh, for printing with ink. Uh, you can make sandblasting masks, and, and a great use of that is for glass. So uh, you can vinyl cut uh, uh, almost any material, and then it absorbs uh, with the sandblaster when you shoot uh, sand at it, and so you can etch patterns into glass. Uh, you can make flexible multi-layer circuits, and we'll see more of that in Electronics Week. A nice thing you can do is rather than having tangles of wires, you can make custom wiring harnesses. Uh, you can make uh, radio antennas, are all things with the vinyl cutter. Uh, now, in it, this is part of the inventory that we're migrating. Uh, these are all just conventional decorative vinyls. Th these are examples of them that are just di different colors. Uh, this material looks like vinyl, but it's very different. And we, we have this, we buy this in thicker rolls. This is a cast epoxy. Um, it's the 3M site is at loading slowly, but this is stronger than vinyl and it's good to higher temperatures. And so we in particular use this in making electronics. Uh, this material is a copper tape with an electrically conducting glue. Again, we use that for things like antennas and circuits. Uh, this is ordinary tape, but we use this to lift material off uh, after you cut it. And then this is a really non-obvious material. Uh, this material um, is an adhesive that doesn't stick to its own backing. So it looks like tape, but when you push it against something, you peel the backing away and you leave the glue on whatever you put it on. And so it lets you turn anything into something you can vinyl cut and then becomes an adhesive sticker. Um, let's see. Kerala is pointing out this example of, um, oh, of uh, making a speaker. 
Oh, that's a nice example. Uh, let me add that. Uh, so yeah, it'll be hard to hear. You should play it locally, but that that's a um, vinyl cut speaker. Uh, so these are all standard materials you should have uh, next to your vinyl cutter. Um, then you need the knives. And so for the vinyl cutter, uh, it goes in a holder. And there's a common misconception in that holder. If you look at the holder, uh, um, it holds the knife. There's a screw um, thing out here. The knife goes in here. And you don't want to screw this all the way in. What you want to do is you want the knife just um, sticking out the depth of cut into the material. If you do this, you're plowing through the material and into the bed. So you want ju just enough sticking out. And then these come in different angles. Uh, a, a flatter blade is stiffer and can cut harder materials. A skinnier blade can cut deeper, but it bends if you try to do it um, in a heavier material. And we use that for uh, finer features. And so then again, you'll have the vinyl, the tape, transfer adhesive, um, these materials. Now, the issue with the vinyl cutter is the laser cutter, other than the laser drooping over time, it doesn't change. Every time you use it, it works exactly the same. The vinyl cutter, what it does uh, depends on what you had for lunch, essentially. It depends on the weather. It depends on the age of the material, the condition of the knife. The conditions change every time you use it. And so you need to do test cuts to adjust the parameters. Uh, and in, in addition, there's just skill in using it. And so for some people, you immediately adopt it and enjoy using it. Um, for others, it's labor intensive and you dislike it. And so the heart of all of that is the weeding process. So. Hong Hao was a student who loved the vinyl cutter. Here he's made a flexible circuit. Um, and he has nice videos that show how he does it. And so there's a lot going on here. So to start, what he's going to do is um, it's, he, he's going to cut a copper circuit. And you could just feed the copper directly onto it and cut on the backing, but it deforms fairly e easily. So the first thing he's doing here is two different steps. So what he just did was there's a flexible plastic backing that makes everything a little bit stiffer. Then he put down a strip of the uh, epoxy film. The copper doesn't stick very well to its own backing. That's the job of the backing. He's sticking it onto the epoxy film that it's going to adhere to more strongly. Then he's going to put all of that in the vinyl cutter. And so by doing it that way, the copper is held much more rigidly and it doesn't deform as the knife cuts. So right now he's cutting it. Then now what he's going to do when it's out is weed it. Um, let's see, uh, Amsterdam, you're noting cricket and copper works well. Good. Um, is that with the copper on its own backing, uh, Hank, or with uh, um, transferring the backing? No, it's transferring. With, okay, with, good. Uh, uh, with, uh, with normal knife, with a drift knife. Good. I am not with a drift knife. Okay, and so you, you did get the replacement machine from them? Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so now, now weeding, weeding is the process of removing the material you didn't want. And uh, 
when you do it wrong, it's really frustrating. If you cut with too much force, you shred the material and it's ruined because it's a mess. If you cut with too little force, it doesn't cut through properly and you can't weed. When you try to weed, everything comes off. But if you cut just right, it's beautifully easy. So in this example, what you're going to see is, um, so you just start peeling and it's really beautiful. You don't really pay attention. You just start peeling. And as you peel, you leave behind what you want. And so you don't have to carefully figure out what's there. You just start pulling and beautifully it leaves behind what you don't want. Now notice one other thing. So in, in doing that weeding that he just did, um, he's not lifting up. Lifting up is trying to pull everything up. What he's doing is he's shearing. He's folding it over and shearing and pulling in plane. And shearing, um, instead of trying to lift the material, helps you pull it away from it. And so when you have the settings right, weeding works easily. When the settings are wrong, it's very frustrating. The other thing is if you weed on the backing material that your stock comes with, it's frustrating because the backing is designed to come off. What you want to do is you use the, the masking tape to transfer your design onto whatever its final surface is. Then when you rub it, typically these are pressure, sense, pressure set adhesives that stick when you push it. Then you weed it on the final surface so it has good adhesion. Um, rather than when you transfer it. And so with all of that, you can vinyl cut. And so the first thing I want you to do is vinyl cut anything. And the killer app for this week is just laptop stickers. Like, does anybody on the call have laptop stickers you can show that you vinyl cut? If anybody could show your laptop to illustrate. Let's see. Uh, Ciudad, you have to talk to get focused. Ciudad, Mexico, if you talk. Yeah, here. I have this one. Okay. Good. Okay. And then, oh, Fran. Yeah. Good. Ah, okay. That, thank you, um, Fran. Thank you, Aristarco. Uh, so th that's a great assignment for this week is. Uh, Take a logo you like, make a new logo for you, but making laptop stickers is classic for this week. Um, uh, ooh, wow. Well, um, if we go to, let's see, Kyle Pierre, what were you, which year were you? Um, I think last year. Yeah. Kyle Pierre is mentioning in. Uh, yeah, for this week, he did a, a um, striking George Floyd sticker. Good. Okay, that's the vinyl cutter. Uh, I'd say the vinyl cutter is maybe the least appreciated tool in the lab. You could almost do the whole class with just the vinyl cutter, uh, but it's frequently ignored going to the laser cutter and then the 3D printer. So one of the goals this week is to appreciate just how much you can do with it. So now comes the laser cutter. So this was a really impressive assignment from Lena in Germany. Um, let's see, we get to her videos. Um, yeah, boy, did she do a good job for this week. So she made a castle construction kit. So this is more than you need to do for the week. So she's uh, cutting out the parts. And in a minute, I'll, when I get to safety, I'll talk about um, what it should look like. Notice right now, you don't see any smoke, how perfectly it's cutting. Uh, I'll talk about what you need for that to happen. Okay, but she, she's cut out her parts, then she's going to assemble them. 
and then uh, this is a kit to make castles. And she has stairs, uh, she has a door, and she has a little mechan she, ha she has curving walls, and she has a little mechanism to drive the gate. So she has a rack and pinion, uh, all, all done on the laser cutter for the week. So more than you need to do, but a great example. So with the laser, uh, you can mark and engrave uh, to draw on it. And you can do it raster where the laser goes back and forth and makes dots, or you can do it with a vector and if the power is light, you draw lines. If the power is heavy, you cut all the way through. So marking and engraving is one thing you can do. Then a really nice thing you can do is half tone. So here I've taken a picture and I'm using the picture intensity to make little holes in this case in a mylar foil. I mean, it's, it's beautiful by itself. But then if you use that for printing, if you take a, for example, an ink for a t-shirt and you print through it, uh, if you're even a slight distance away, like newsprint, you don't see the dots, you just see the intensity and it becomes grayscale. And so it lets you make beautiful grayscale halftone printing. And so uh, these are what the holes look like uh, up close. And so um, I did that in a predecessor to mods. Um, uh, this is an app for doing half toning. Oh, and the link is broken for that. And in fact, um, let me add a note to that. Um, Fran, we should really port the, uh, we should port this to current uh, mods project uh, for half toning. Hi, Captain. Sorry, what? Hi, Captain. Okay, hi, Captain. <laughs> um, yeah, um, there, there's so many uses for that. That would be a nice thing to do. Uh, I, if there's any problems, I can help with that. Okay, so then comes the focus for this week, which is cutting through and making press fit uh, um, assembly. Uh, so this is a free CAD file on joints. So the first joint, if we go back to, uh, let's take, so if you look at this marble construction kit, it's full of joints between these parts. So the simplest joint is this one, which is just a slot. They just fit in each other. Uh, this is, multiply bad. The first reason is it needs a chamfer. These, these are commonly ignored, but are really needed. Uh, if you have a sharp corner like that, you have to assemble it exactly vertically. Uh, what the chamfer does is it looks like this. And that does two things. The first thing it does is if you come in slightly misaligned, it helps you align it. So you don't have to align it perfectly. And then the second thing is in, in making the press fit joint, the tolerance is very tight. So the chamfer very slightly compresses the material. Um, uh, Okay, uh, Stephen has the fixed link. Good. So what the chamfer does is it slightly compresses the material on the way in. So if you don't chamfer, the joint's really fussy. It's hard to assemble. With the chamfer, it's much, much easier to get the joint in. Okay, so that's this one. Now, the, the way the chamfer works is if you look at displacement versus force, on a press fit, there's a stick slip. When there's enough force, it's, 
it, it sticks. And then as you start pulling, it slips. And that's very sensitive to the material properties. So if you look at this joint, there's a little bump there and a cut out there. What that one is doing is the, the joint has a little bump like that. And then what it's going into has a little notch cut out. Uh, so when you slide it in, this is a cutout inside, the bump rides over it, falls into there. And now if you want to pull on this, rather than relying on the friction here, um, the this little bump in there is holding it for you. And so it's much more forgiving for the material properties to make the joint and it's a stronger joint. The problem with that one is when you push it in, you're pushing against this bump in the material and so it depends on the material property. So the improvement of that is you make the bump, but you put the bump on a flexure and we saw flexures earlier. So now this is the same idea that the bump is going to go into a, a slot in the material, but now this beam can bend and how this flexes, you can determine by the thickness of the beam. And so it separates it from the compressibility of the material. Uh, so this is a flexural joint, and this is very similar to just like a buckle on a backpack or a belt. Then the next kind of joint is a pinned joint. And so uh, if you look at a, um, a pinned looking joint, uh, this is a common sort of um, joint in wood woodworking. Um, where uh, you have a separate tab coming in. And so you slide these together. And rather than any flexures, once you slide it together, you put a pin through it. And now the pin is what holds the joint from moving. And so this is an extra step to pin it, but these are the strongest joints. So those are for perpendicular joints. Then for right angle joints, the most common joint you'll see a lot of is finger joints. And you saw that, for example, in Lena's castle. Finger joints are very common. They're not great though, because there's very little holding the finger joint. Uh, so better is, if you look at this joint, this is, it's like the flexure, but now the flexure is going through. And so that joint holds much more strongly. And so an example of that joint is, let's see, if we look at the, go back to the snap. Um, this was an early machine building project that helped start the machine building. And uh, this is using, if you look at these, you, when you push this in there, these fingers snap. And so rather than a finger joint, this is a really substantial load bearing joint with these snaps sticking through. Um, and then uh, this is, uh, this is an, again, another version of, these are common in woodworking. If you look at a woodworking uh, wedge joint, what you do is uh, you, you, you make the slot go through and then you have a tapered wedge and then you just tap the wedge in until it stops moving. And so you don't even need to get the dimensions particularly close. The wedge um, go, goes in more or less until it finds the right place. And then everything is very tightly constrained. And so these are much more substantial uh, right angle joints. Okay, so you're gonna need to design joints. And so an example of all of that is this is a, uh, construction kit that was originally developed by my kids called uh, GIC. 
And I did this one in FreeCAD. And so this is a very parametric design. This is a good example of why you needed parametric. So if in this design, I've got a spreadsheet. If you look at the spreadsheet, I specify all the properties of it. Then with the spreadsheet, I go to the sketcher and the sketcher gives me the parts. And so if I change one parameter, the whole design adjusts. And then within this environment, um, uh, see, I'm just showing here, I can use the offsetting in the environment to offset for the tool, which I'll talk more about. And over here, I'm using an assembly and I'm making a 3D assembly of the 2D parts. And so that's an example of the uh, parametric design you need for the week. Now, a couple of things to know about. One is you need to be within a few thousandths of an inch. On one side below, it's sloppy and doesn't hold together. On the other side, it doesn't even fit. And the tolerance is just a few thousandths of an inch. So a standard thing you do is um, make a comb of uh, joints of tabs that get skinnier and skinnier. I'm exaggerating, but like vary these by in inches, 0 0.001. Uh, each one increases by that. And you make a comb and, and you sample to see where you get the best joint fit. And the tolerance is, is very close. Uh, second thing I mentioned um, um, in the first part is when you have something like I drew a flexure like this, uh, when this bends, there's stress concentration here and here, and that's where it's going to crack. And so when you can fit it, what you want to do is you want to fill it these like that so you don't get stress concentration uh, at that joint. Uh, now, beyond this is these are examples of cutting hinges. So uh, I've made a few different patterns. And these are a lot of little flexures that each bend a little bit. And what that lets you do is take a flat sheet and you can curve it. Um, so uh, those are uh, living hinges. Uh, this is examples of flexures. So uh, on the one on here, we'll see in machining week is called kerfing, where you don't cut all the way through. But if you look at these, um, this is Vladimir in Moscow. If you look at these uh, smooth curving shapes, you start with a flat material, but you cut a flexural pattern uh, to make a curving uh, shape. And then this is a link to a thesis on flexures, exactly the flexures we saw before. Uh, um, this is a link to a thesis that talks all, of, let's see, there's some good images in here that talks about the design of the flexures uh, and the performance of them. Uh, let's see, Michael, um, what is this showing, Michael? Um, At the corners of the 3D printer, uh, you see uh, also a joint with screws. Oh, yeah. So the reason I, I didn't mention those and I don't, don't like those is those are strongly dependent on the material properties. And in particular, if the material is at all deformable, these walk over time. Um, the, uh, the the nut deforms the materials and these soften up. It, you're right, it's a common joint, but these only work in fairly hard materials. These are commonly used, like early MakerBot used these, and it, um, after about a year, the whole machine would get floppy, is the issue oh, with them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I'm linking, th this was a student thesis, just to look a little further ahead. Um, he's using a fancy laser cutter uh, in my lab that's much higher resolution. And what he's doing is, see if this, um, let me get to the nice example. 
um, he's making uh, microelectromechanical systems. Uh, and so he has some nice, or, see, there's still better images, I think. Um, so we we had talked about, okay, those are up to the relays already. We had talked about, okay, so here, uh, making, for example, using accelerometers and gyros. This is what they look like inside. And here what he's doing is he's using a very high resolution laser instead of a chip fab to actually cut out those shapes and make those devices directly. So what is laser? Laser is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. That's what LASER is. Uh, in a laser, just there's a, what you need to know is there's a material that makes the light. It has a ground state. Uh, it gets excited to an exciting state. Then there's a transition to a so energy comes in to make it get excited. Then it makes a transition that radiates light and then it relaxes back down. And so that's all the quantum mechanics you need to know. But what it means is there is a medium that lases. You have to pump energy into the medium. Um, then you have to couple that energy back out. So a typical laser cavity um, has very high reflectance mirrors. Typically, there's some shape to them. Uh, then there's our, our lasing medium, and I'll talk about these, where you're pumping energy in. Then light is bouncing back and forth. And each time one photon comes in, it makes two then two come back in and they make four and you get amplification of the light. Then it goes out through an output coupler and out here, there's a shape that looks like this. I'm exaggerating. Um, this is called the waste of the beam, like your waste. And that sets the, the, si the finest feature you can cut. So a, a typical laser cutter, the beam waste is about 0 0.01 inches. On, on the um, uh, MEMS I showed you, that was much smaller. That was maybe 10 uh, microns uh, on the micromachining laser. Another implication of this is if we look at the laser beam waste, if you put your material here, you get the finest cut. But if you're above or below that, um, it gets broader. Usually that's bad. You're losing resolution. Sometimes it's intentional if you want to blur features out. Um, the other thing to know is the laser needs um, very high reflectance mirrors. And then typically there's a, a path. So in the laser cutter, the laser source typically has to go off a few mirrors before it gets to where the cutting happens. Um, these are high reflection mirrors. Uh, if these mirrors get dirty, you lose power, which is bad. But what's even worse is uh, you can destroy the mirrors, which I'll talk about. Uh, and so the gain medium. The most common gain medium we're going to use is a CO2 laser. And these have been um, commoditized. And you can now get really cheap uh, laser tubes that work reasonably well. So everything I just described is going on inside that uh, tube. Uh, Carbon dioxide lases at 10 microns. That's uh, pretty far in infrared. You can't see it, which is dangerous. So it has to be enclosed. Uh, but it's absorbed very well by most uh, plastics, wood, cardboard, commonly used for cutting. Fiber lasers are an optical fiber that's doped to have gain. Those typically lays at one micron. 
which is bad for cutting wood or plastic, but it's good for metal. Um, these are solid state lasing material. These are used, for example, in compact disc players. Um, these let you tune further to short wavelength. And then the very shortest of all are what are called uh, excimers for far ultraviolet. These get used in things like uh, integrated circuit fabrication. But you're going to likely be using a CO2 labor laser, and you might have a fiber laser. So Trotec, for example, makes um, uh, lasers that are more expensive. These are now, um, say, thirty or forty thousand dollars. But what these have is both a fiber laser and a CO2 laser in one, and I'll shortly show why that's interesting. Now, lasers aren't transporters. So you're going to cut. When, when you cut, the material goes away, but it has to go somewhere. And there isn't a single process. There's actually many processes. So lasers can burn. Uh, they can melt. They can evaporate. They can ablate where you blast it off. And those are all going on. Uh, Depending on how thick the material is, you can't do that in one go. You might need more than one pass of the laser to get all the way through. And so in turn, that means airflow is essential. So uh, here's, say, some cardboard. Uh, here's our laser beam coming in, cutting it. The laser is trying very hard to ignite the cardboard. It's putting a lot of energy in a small space. The cardboard really wants to um, catch on fire. So typically, the head bringing the laser beam in also includes airflow. Um, what the airflow is doing is it's blowing into it. It's pushing the, all those combustion products out to the bottom. And then your laser has an exhaust that's sucking them out, uh, out of the bed. So if you ever look in a laser and you see smoke coming out, right away you should scream and say, it's not working right. Uh, the air assist should be pushing the combustion products down. And then they should be leaving the chamber with the exhaust. Now, if you walk into a lab and you smell a chemical smell, you should yell at somebody because when you laser cut a plastic, there's fairly nasty volatile chemicals coming off. And that goes on for a minute or so. So after you laser cut, you don't want to take your stock out immediately. You want to give it some time to vent. Now, the vent, uh, there are uh, best is big blowers that uh, vent to the outside, but you need somewhere to vent it to. Um, you can buy laser cutter filters, these sort of things. And so these have a heavy duty filter that you blow through, but these aren't great. They don't work perfectly and the filters have a lifetime. So if at all possible, you want to vent to the outside. If you can't vent to the outside, you need to do that. But you have to have a vent for the laser cutter. Next comes kerf. So kerf is, uh, if here's our material, here's the laser beam. Kerf is what's removed. And so in beginner laser cutting, you have a design and you put the laser on the line. But remember, I said a good joint has to be accurate to within about a thousandth of an inch. And the laser beam is 10 thousandths of an inch. And so what that means is if you want the edge to be here, you have to put the laser here. You have to offset the laser by half of the beam diameter so that you end up with the right shape. So that's accounting for the curve. 
which I'll talk about um, uh, uh, a little more shortly. So safety, this, the laser is one of the most common tools in the lab and it's one of the most dangerous. Uh, what I'm showing in this picture is in, in my lab, there are some students working on the laser cutter. They were doing a big long job. They went off to read their email and then they wondered why there were fire trucks outside the building and didn't realize the laser had caught on fire and threatened to burn down the whole building. What had happened was the belt broke on the laser, the head stopped moving, all the energy kept going into one place and it caught on fire. So laser cutters are always trying to catch on fire. The number one rule is, let's say this is the laser cutter in your lab, you know, maybe it's against a wall, um, you should have on the floor of your lab a prominent line. And you can have a chair in here, but the rule on the line is when you're laser cutting, you can't cross the line. If, if you're next to a laser and it catches on fire, you can stop it right away. Um, but if you have your back to the laser and um, you, uh, uh, see Adrian is posting a nice image, which I will add. Um, uh, as long as you're looking at the laser, you can stop the fire right away. But if you have your back to the laser, if you're out here, um, it can ignite. And um, when it ignites, it's really, really bad. Because if we go back to uh, this picture, the air assist is preventing it from catching on fire. But if you start a real fire here, suddenly we have this chamber that's blowing air on the fire and helping the fire grow. And so almost every lab that has a laser cutter has had a laser cutter fire. It's one of the most hazardous things that can happen to your lab. So the number one rule is you wanna make the boundary for the user. Um, the second rule is you need to know what happens. So when you're cutting, if it just begins to ignite, there's an interlock. If you open the, the lid of the laser cutter, it'll turn off the laser. And as long as it's not too bad, it'll stop right away. But if the fire continues, uh, you don't wanna shoot a fire extinguisher at your laser because then it'll be a mess to clean up. Uh, what you should have is a blanket next to the laser. Um, it, it can be a piece of stock the size of the laser bed. And what you wanna do is smother the fire um, to put it out. And then if it's so bad, that that doesn't do it, <clears throat> then don't be a hero and call a fire department. But this is one of the most serious uh, safety things. The other safety things are, again, if your laser is not <clears throat> vented properly, you'll be breathing uh, smoke and combustion products that aren't healthy. So you shouldn't smell anything when you're laser cutting. And then this is a safety issue for the health of your lab's budget, which is if you laser cut with dirty lenses, the power will go down, but eventually the lenses will blow up because they're absorbing energy and you waste money. And so part of this week is learning how to clean the lenses. Okay, materials for the laser cutter. The uh, there's an epilogue has a nice summary of uh, materials. Within that, far and away, the best material for this week is cardboard. Uh, cardboard is rated by an edge crush test. And the easy way to explain it is bad cardboard, if you bend it, will kink. Good cardboard, if you bend it, will bow. And so if it kinks, that makes a bad joint. If it bends smoothly, that makes a good joint. So to supply the lab, we buy these heavy duty shipping sheets. But once you get used to this, anytime you receive a box at home in your lab, just bend a little flap. And if it's stiff, 
use cardboard you receive in your lab uh, in the laser cutter. But uh, this is very cheap. It's dollars a sheet, and it's a very environmentally friendly material. It, it comes from plants, and it's easily recycled. And so you can do much of the class just with cardboard. I really recommend uh, using cardboard for this week. Um, <clears throat> you can laser cut wood, um, and in particular, uh, ordinary wood sheets you buy have more variation in thickness. And so you can get special wood for laser cutting that has uh, tighter tolerances. Um, uh, acrylic, plexiglass, uh, perspex, lucite, um, it, it cuts uh, very easily. Um, it glues nicely. What's neat about acrylic glue is it's not really a glue. It actually melts the material, so they, they join into each other. Um, you can bend it thermally. So when you laser cut acrylic, um, you can heat it to make curving joints. And uh, this was a nice project done by a colleague at MIT where um, uh, um, what she's doing is uh, putting in the stock. Oh, I went too fast. Um, let's, sorry, let's go back a little further. So she cuts out the shape. Then uh, she's going to use the laser. She's defocusing it intentionally to spread it out. And she's going to use it to soften the material. And now she's making a joint to bend it. Uh, and so that's bending it right in the laser. Um, Delrin cuts okay in the laser. It's kind of smoky and it's a sort of soft, smushy material. Uh, fabric cuts beautifully. Uh, pasta actually cuts really nicely in the laser cutter. Uh, that, that, that's a very friendly material you, you can uh, laser cut. Uh, PVC um, doesn't. PVC releases chlorine. So Jason, uh, she has a, at the link there, you can read a paper about how she did it. Um, PVC releases chlorine that's hazardous. You don't, hazardous to you, hazardous to the machine. You don't laser cut PVC. It's hard to tell. If you're not sure what a plastic is, if you make a flame and you see color, that means uh, stay away from it. But you should have a rule in your lab. You only cut materials where you know where they can come from. You don't want to risk cutting um, chlorine materials. Uh, um, yeah, uh, Rico, it depends on it. Nat uh, natural fabric cuts great. Synthetic fabric is a little more demanding for settings I'll talk about in a minute. Um, polycarbonate, you can't cut unless you have a much heavier uh, power uh, laser. Metal needs a much heavier power, but th this is a material and there's DIY versions that you can put on metal and then uh, use the laser to mark rather than cut through it. Now, on the laser, there's multiple settings. You have to focus the beam. Um, you have to set the laser power. The speed is how fast it moves. And then uh, the rate is typically, these are pulsed lasers, and it's the frequency of it. And uh, the trade-off is uh, if you cut with laser pulses too far apart, it's discontinuous. Um, but if they're too close together, you're putting too much energy in the same place and you can get melting and deformation. And so there's an ideal setting where the laser pulses are set just, just the right distance apart. Let's see, Arnie is noting you can mark chocolate. That's a good uh, point. Um, and then uh, you need to pick vector or raster. And so there's some misunderstanding about this. Raster, it just goes back and forth. And that's commonly used to make images. But in a raster image, what you're relying on is varying laser power to vary the image intensity. And that can be hard to dial in. You can use vector cutting to make images also. But there, you only have typically one setting. Either it's on or off. But by making nesting contours or little circles, you can draw images vector mode but it can be more forgiving for the image because you don't have to tune um, the intensity of it. 
And most laser cutters can mix them. So you can do uh, raster cutting in part of the design and you can pick part of the design to vector cut. So each week from now on, there's going to be a group assignment. Uh, group assignments are things each student doesn't need to do individually, but your lab needs to do together. Let's see, Aristarco is showing laser grilled chicken. Um, um, I, I know I've seen lots of versions of uh, toast and laser cutters. I've never seen um, chicken. Let's see. That's loading slowly, but um, toast laser cutter. Uh, you, you can la laser cut uh, custom toast with patterns um, like these. You can make beautiful toast. Uh, so the, uh, oh, Roman, you're saying you can make car caramel in the laser? Yes. How does that work? <laughs> we, we tried that in, in 2012. Like, uh, okay. yeah. Okay, so as a lab, I want you to do this as a group, but then I want each of you, as a group, you document it, but each of you just note the group assignment, what you learn from it, but try varying the focus, vary the power, speed, rate, learn how all those settings change the cutting, learn the right settings for your material, then characterize what is the curve of your laser cutter, what is the correct clearance to make a good joint and test a comparison of the different joint types. Then uh, all the words here matter in that this is a kit. And the point of the kit is it's a design exercise. I want you to design something that can be assembled in more than one way. So just to think about how to make a construction kit. And it has to be parametric. So I want you to have parameters for things like the material thickness and the design adjusts as you vary the parameter. So you need one of the parametric design tools. And I want you to account for the curve. So one parameter is the laser cutter curve. And I want your design to offset for it. You can offset using a cam tool, uh, for example, mods that does that. Or you can offset in a CAD tool to do the offsetting and have the laser cut on the line. But I want you to account for the curve. And then the extra credit is play with flexures and curving. So you can have curving surfaces as well as uh, flat surfaces in your design. OK. Any questions or comments? Hi, Neil. Yeah. Uh, um, I would like to share. Um, go ahead. So, something that we made at the lab. Yep. This is a, with the laser. We made it in a in a in a floor tile. It's a, a very interesting example of the uh, variety of things that you can do with the with the laser. Ah, okay. Uh, beautiful. Thanks, Aristarco. Thank you. Um, Hafey Fab Lab question. Um, yeah, sorry, I uh, was looking for the button. Okay, yeah, question. So when you say a kit, uh, you talk about it having to be able to put it together in different ways. So it's not a yep. kit like making a dinosaur or something. It has to be something that can be made into more than one thing. Am I understanding correctly? Right, and this, this is flexible. It's, it's just a design exercise, meaning it could be a dinosaur, but it would be something that could make more than one kind of dinosaur, not just one dinosaur. And the okay. point is, if you just want one kind of dinosaur, you can just slice the dinosaur up. But it's a little, it's an interesting design challenge to think about something that could let you make more than one kind of dinosaur. Okay. It, it, it's a, a pretty flexible interpretation. That's not the heart of the week. It's just a design exercise. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to uh, be clear. Jason? Hey, um, I had a question about on the group assignments. Um, yep. For 
people like Walter are in my position where we're working a bit remotely from standardized Fab Lab tools. Like uh, my makerspace has two different uh, laser cutters in it, but they're not identical to each other. And I don't think they're the same as the Fab Lab ones. So I was wondering how to oh, make no, I mean, There is no standard Fab Lab one. I, I just okay. want to make sure everybody gets to go through this, meaning you, you need to do a focal series to see what happens oh, as you defocus. Um, push car, you need to mute. Um, okay, I muted everyone. Um, uh, but you can un unmute um, uh, who I was just talking to. Um, I want you to vary the rate to see how that changes the cut quality. I want you to measure the curve of the laser um, and compare joint types. And uh, the reason it's a group assignment is it's a lot of work for every student to do it separately. So you just need to do it for your lab. So whatever lab you're working in, make sure this gets done. And that should just be an important part of the documentation in the lab. Okay. Um, I, so I'm working remotely from my lab. I, I might not have conveyed that well. Um, but nevertheless, meaning okay. it, 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 it has to be done. Your lab has to do this. And I want yeah. you, meaning um, as a as a group, the lab does it individually. I want you all just to review it and note what you learn from it. So you need to make sure gotcha. your remote lab does it. And then in your own documentation, you know this is instructive. So you know in your own documentation, take away the high points from it. Like you need to know the curve to do this week's assignment. And so note what you learn from the group assignment. But it's okay if you if it's done at a distance as long as you learn from it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So with that, happy laser cutting. We're finally in the lab. Um, see you all Monday for recitation on design. And um, have a good week. Bye bye. Same to you. Bye. Adios. Bye bye. 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 Bye.